back with you once again and I suppose they say that uh, sacred cows make the best hamburgers. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but we might be finding out tonight because we're just about to, to go after one of the sacred cows of the American left, that's for sure. You'll see what I'm talking about here in just a couple of minutes. But to get this thing started off uh, tonight's presentation, I, I think we're all sort of familiar with the Democrats' divide and conquer strategy that they use whenever they're out there trying to get votes. What do I mean by divide and conquer? Well, if you've ever heard a Democratic candidate or a Democratic commercial or even a Democratic speaker trying to woo voters, you likely have been struck, I know I have, you've likely been struck by the idea that what they always do is when they're talking to that voter, they try and, and convince that voter that they're part of some subgroup of America and that as a member of that subgroup, there are certain wants and needs and grievances that that group has and that therefore that individual voter must obviously have and the Democrats then try to convince them that the rest of America, mainstream America, the wealthy are somehow in cahoots to hold that subgroup down or to undercut them and that's where the Democrats come in saying you know what you need us in your corner you need to elect us because we'll use government to make sure that you get your fair share. Now that's a very general statement I know uh, and it, it, there probably goes into a lot more detail than that but if you really think about it and you think back to the Democratic campaign ads and speeches that you've seen you'll you'll notice that I'm right that that tends to be a uh, a common thread among every Democratic candidate and every Democratic campaign ad that you'll see and it's true that Democrats do this with every type of group imaginable you know they do it with African Americans they do it with women they do it with Hispanics, they do it with union workers, they do it with the poor, they do it with gays, they try to do it with the middle class, but that doesn't work out too well for them, all the time anyway. Uh, they, they probably try to do it with midgets and tell midgets that everybody else is against them. So it's a common tenet of democratic strategy that we're all probably familiar with on some level. So that's the starting point of tonight. But the question I want to ask is acknowledging the divide and conquer tactics of the Democratic Party and more largely the American left, which group is it that has responded with the most loyalty to the Democrats? Which group is it that has responded best, if you want to say that, to that strategy? Well, in my estimation, the one group of voters who has been more responsive to that tactic than any other group of voters has been African Americans. Now, there's a sacred cow that we're going to talk about tonight that's going to make everybody mad. I'm actually going to question a couple of things. First of all, why are African American voters so loyal to the Democratic Party and to the American left? And more importantly, is that loyalty of African Americans to the left justified? Are they better off for having been loyal to the American left? Or are they not? I think it's an interesting question, and, and there are some people out there right now hearing this whose heads are exploding simply because I'm bothering to ask the question. This is one of those questions that you're just not supposed to ask, and you're just supposed to accept on face value. I'm not going to do that. I think it makes for a very, very interesting discussion. Now, when I say that African Americans have been extremely loyal to the Democratic Party, that sounds like a general statement. I understand that. I have some numbers to back it up. Uh, and I'm no statistician. I don't have a uh, education in statistics, but I think even I, uh, who, who is a novice to this field, will see something very interesting here. What I'm about to share with you is the percentage of African American voters who voted for the Democratic candidate in each of the last nine elections, going back to 1976. I know numbers can get kind of dry, so bear with me a little bit while I go through these. But you're going to see what I'm talking about here momentarily. In 1976, 83% of all African Americans voted for Jimmy Carter. In 1984, once again, 83% of African Americans voted for Jimmy Carter. In 1984, 91% of African Americans voted for Walter Mondale. And if you recall the ass-kicking that that election was, they might have been the only people that voted for Walter Mondale. But nevertheless, Mondale got even more support from the black community than Carter did. Uh, 1988, 89% of African Americans voted for Michael Dukakis. 80, in, in 1992, 83% of blacks voted for Bill Clinton. 1996, 84% voted for Bill Clinton. 2000, 
90% of African Americans voted for Al Gore. 2004, 88% of African Americans voted for Mr. Personality, John Kerry. And in 2008, as we all are very familiar with now, 95% of African Americans voted for Barack Obama. Now, that's a lot of numbers. I know you're digesting them. Sit back and think about it for a second. 83%, 84%, 91%, 89%, 95%, 90%—those numbers are huge. Those numbers are consistent. They're not really all over the board. That's about as solid of a voting group as you can get. Statistically speaking, that's about as close as you can get to the word unanimous. I mean, it's amazing. Now let's compare that to to another group that. Uh, Democrats always try to woo, and that's the, the female voter. How the female voters responded to the Democratic candidates in each of, of those same elections. 1976, 52% of, of women voted for Jimmy Carter. It was 46% in 1980, 42% voting for Mondale in 1984, 49% voting for Dukakis in 88, 45% voting for Clinton in 1992, 55% voting for Clinton in 1996, 54% voting for Al Gore in 2000, 51% voting for John Kerry in 2004, and 56% voting for Obama in 2008. So, to me, there's a very striking difference in those numbers if we're going to compare those two groups. If you are a Democratic strategist, if you are a Democratic campaign manager, you know, statistically speaking, based on those numbers, that if you talk to a female voter and you can get that female voter out to the polls, you can convince her to show up to the polls on election day, that on the face of it, there's roughly a 50-50 chance that, you'll vote, that she'll vote for your candidate. So in other words, you're probably going to have to do some convincing to make sure she's on the right side of that 50%. But you also know, by those same numbers, that if you can get an African-American voter to go to the polls, you really don't have to do much convincing. You just have to get them out there because it's almost certain they will vote for the Democratic candidate. As I said, as solid of a voting group, as a voting bloc, as there is in American politics. How key is this voting group? Well, there are people who have done a lot of research on the subject, although you don't hear much about it. One of them is one of America's great intellectuals and one of America's great academics, he, 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 might, he, he might hit me for calling him an intellectual, I don't know. Uh, but a man who's done tremendous research and, and written a lot of books on this topic, a guy named Thomas Sowell, Dr. Thomas Sowell, one of the great American thinkers you're ever going to see. Uh, if this is a type of topic that you have an interest in, if race relations in America is something that interests you, particularly race relations in politics in the 20th century, then you need to read some Thomas Sowell if you haven't already. I would recommend this book, Black Rednecks and White Liberals by Thomas Sowell. Uh, this is a magnificent book that will give you a great introduction to the true history of race and history of slavery and history of civil rights in America. Um, now, I'll be honest with you. This book is not an easy read. It's not a quick read. You're going to take some time with it. You're going to have to plow through it. But you're going to be better off for it. So there's my, I don't know if you want to call it an advertisement or an endorsement or whatever, but... If what we're talking about tonight interests you, go pick up Thomas Sowell, and particularly that book. Anyway, uh, Thomas Sowell's done, done a lot of research on this, and he surmises that if the Democratic Party ever slipped to just 70% of the African American vote, they would never win Congress or the White House ever again. 70% is a big number, but you've just seen that, they, that the Democratic Party has cleared that number with African Americans time and again from the 1960s onward. So, if that's all it takes, and, and if, if it's just a 70% number that would turn things around, then one has to ask the question, why is the, why is the loyalty so high? And is there anything as a, as a conservative we can do to, to change that? Or is, is that loyalty justified on the part of the African American? Now, Thomas Sowell points out in one of his articles, he was also quoted in, in a Walter E. Williams article having said this, Walter E. Williams is another person who's done a lot of great research and thought on this type of topic. Uh, Thomas Sowell has surmised and, and has, has stated that he believes the Democratic Party has essentially tried to keep African Americans paranoid. Uh, has tried to keep them scared. Uh, 
over the last 50 to 60 years of American history. I mean, when you think back, since blacks have had the right to vote, they have, it has not been solid Democrat the whole time, not by a long shot. They were solidly in the Republican camp after the Civil War. And for, for many years after that, it wasn't until the 1930s and 1940s that a lot of African Americans started switching over and voting for FDR, Franklin Roosevelt. A lot of other people did too. And then in the 1960s, it really ramped up with the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act, and that seemed to be the thing that, that flipped a lot of African Americans over to the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party to stay. So that seemed to be the place where, where it really happened, and then you just heard the election numbers from a lot of the elections since that time that have just been uh, absolutely solid Democrats. So let's look at the effects of African-American loyalty to the Democratic Party since the 1960s. Let's ask the question, are blacks better off now because of their loyalty to the Democratic Party than they were prior to it? Has life improved for African-Americans since the uh, loyalty to the Democratic Party than it was before? Are they better off? Well, as I look at the numbers, I'm not sure that they are. You know, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president in the 1960s, late 60s, uh, one of his landmark programs was the Great Society. And that was a series of social programs that were allegedly supposed to uh, help the African American uh, communities and then the poor communities in America, help those people kind of get a hand up and, and, and to kind of level the playing field, if you will, and to make things, make, to, to allow those people to have a better shot in society. But has that actually happened? Well, there's numbers out there that indicate that it really hasn't. In other words, the thought behind the Great Society was that, you know, African Americans are so far down the ladder right now, and the poor in America are so far down the ladder, that they need government help to bring them up. Did that government help really bring them up? Or was that really the case at all? I mentioned Walter E. Williams a little bit earlier. Another great book you should read, Liberty Versus the Tyranny of Socialism by Walter E. Williams. It's a series of his uh, newspaper columns. And he, uh, he does a lot of great work in this area in talking about these sort of things. According to Williams, in 1940, well before the Great Society, poverty among black families was 87%, but it fell to 47% by 1960. So in the 20 years prior to the Great Society, poverty among African Americans fell from 87% to 47%. That's, that's impressive. That tells you that there was a tremendous advancement of African Americans during that 20 year period without significant government interference. Also, uh, Dr. Thomas Sowell's research points out, and again quoting from, from Williams here, Dr. Thomas Sowell's research points out that in various skilled trades, the incomes of blacks relative to whites more than doubled between 1936 and 1959. What's more, the rise of blacks in professional and other high-level occupations was greater during the five years preceding the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than the five years afterward. Wow! I bet you never heard that one in history class, did you? In 1940, 86% of black children were born inside marriage, and the illegitimacy rate among blacks was about 15%. Today, 31% of black children are born inside marriage, and the illegitimacy rate hovers around 70%. Is that improvement? I can't say that it is. And then you look at that 20-year period before the Great Society, when poverty among blacks fell from 87% to 47%, and things are going along swimmingly, uh, at least in terms of, of the advancement of African-American people in, in finances and society. And then we get to the Great Society, which effectively was a brick wall. Has, has, the, uh, has that rate continued to improve in African Americans since the 1960s? I sincerely doubt it has. Look at your average inner city. It's not gone well. Indeed, violence in those African American communities has gone up since the Great Society. It, it, particularly when compared to the, the crime rates and the murder rates outside of black society going on from, from Williams here. In 2005, the nationwide murder rate uh, per 100,000 the population was 5.6. That's for all the nation. But in cities with large black populations, they had higher murder rates. Gary, Indiana had 58. 
uh, being being a per capita there. 58. Richmond, Virginia, 43. Detroit, 39. Washington, D.C., 35. So if we can say that the economic advancement of African Americans that was well on its way prior to the Great Society leveled off or stopped. And if we can say the crime rate in African American communities advanced after the Great Society, and if we can say that the illegitimacy rate, which in my opinion is a large part of what has spurred the, crime, the, the larger crime rates, if that illegitimacy rate went up, has the Great Society and all the social programs that followed it, have they really been a positive for the black community or for poor people in general? I can't see where they have been. I can't see where they have been. In fact, you know, some people, and this is a, another uh, quote from a Williams article here, some argue that the state of the black family, talking about the illegitimacy rate here, some argue that the state of the black family is a result of the legacy of slavery, discrimination, and poverty. That has to be nonsense. A study of 1880 family structure in Philadelphia shows that three quarters of black families were nuclear families comprised of two parents and children. In New York City in 1925, 85% of kin related black households had two parents. In fact, according to Herbert, Herbert Gutman in The Black Family and Slavery and Freedom, 1750 1925, Five and six children under the age of six live with both parents. So the, illiter the, the uh, illegitimacy rate that we see now has not always been there. That's a relatively recent development. And it's a recent development since the 1960s, since the Great Society, since government programs that eliminated the need for the male parent to stay in the household and support the family. You want to know what the problem is? There's a lot of it right there. A lot of people, as Thomas Sowell pointed out in the Democratic Party on the American left, like to use that paranoia and like to scare black people and like to, to make them think that discrimination and, and the wrongs of society are the reasons for all of the difficulties that, that a lot of them face. That's the reason for illegitimacy. Well, we just saw proof that it wasn't. That that's the reason for... Uh, lack of advancement. Again, we've seen that it's not. Uh, but what we need to point out, again, according to Walter E. Williams here, another one of his articles, the gains, speaking of the gains of the African American community, the gains will remain elusive so long as black civil rights and political leadership blame and focus their energies on discrimination. While discrimination exists, the relevant question is how much of what we see can be explained by it. A 70% illegitimacy rate, 60% of black children raised in female-headed households, high crime and poor school performance have devastating consequences. This level of pathology cannot be attributed to discrimination considering that much of it was absent in earlier times when there was far more discrimination, greater pro poverty, and fewer opportunities. So, while the Democratic Party largely has tried to convince the African American community that the ills they are facing are the result of discrimination, are the result of an unfair society, the numbers I just gave you the research I just gave you proves otherwise. In other words, African Americans and African American communities were really starting to turn the corner prior to the 1960s. Not unlike Irish communities had done before that. Not unlike German communities had done before that. Not unlike Asian American communities have done since that time. African Americans, well, there's no doubt they endured a lot of horrible things in terms of discrimination and, and, and Jim Crow and, and all of those things. Nobody's, nobody's denying that. But in spite of all of that, they were starting to thrive. They were putting it all together. And then the Democratic Party came along and convinced them that they could only succeed through the help of the American left. So here we are seeing time and again, liberalism hurting 
the African American community. Liberalism being one of the biggest obstacles that the African American community faces, and yet Democrats and liberals still get a tremendous amount of support from that community. That's hard. That, that's hard to consider logically. That's hard to make sense. It, it doesn't make sense, really, except for the fact that, uh, and unfortunately I have to say it, I, I think a lot of people are believing what they're told and, and are not actually seeing what's in front of them, and that's a tragedy. That's a shame. Now, is all of this criticism of the left, is all of this pointing out how, how wrong they've been and, and how their actions have worked against African Americans rather than for them, is all of this just a case of misguided policy or is it a case of the Democrats trying to, to hold African Americans back and keep them from succeeding? Well, that's a blanket question. I don't know that you can, that you can give one answer for that for every member of the Democratic Party. I'm sure you can't. I'm sure there are people within the Democratic Party over the years who have advocated these type of policies out of the goodness of their hearts. Their heart was in the right place. Politics were misguided. They didn't necessarily think some of these things out. But I'm sure some of these politicians had the best intentions. But not all of them. Consider Lyndon Johnson, the man who brought about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The man who's looked upon by a lot of Americans, including African Americans, as really the, the, one of the guys that really turned it around for the black community. And, and that really, he's one of the people that, he's one of the people that got things going in the right direction. How pure were his intentions? Well, let's find out. I have here a quote from Johnson when he was discussing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with two governors right after signing it. Johnson said, and I quote, Although I'm going to uh, remove a word from this quote, you're going to understand why very quickly. Johnson said, and I quote, All have them, in words, voting Democratic for 200 years. It's right there. He said it. The patriarch of the Civil Rights Act said it. All have those racial epithets. All have them voting Democrat for 200 years. So at least for one very significant Democrat, one who drove the Civil Rights Act, this entire appeal, this entire charade, at least to one guy, was about little more than getting votes. And sadly, Johnson has been right. I don't know if, if, if they're going to vote, if African Americans are going to vote Democratic for 200 years, but they certainly have for 50. So Johnson's a quarter of the way there. And it's kind of sad when you think about it. When you see the effects of liberal policy on African Americans. When you see a group of people that when left to their own devices were starting to really do well in our society. They were, they were becoming a much more important financial and fiscal force. They were rising through the ranks. And then the Democrats got a hold of them. Now, this might sound like I'm being critical of African Americans. I don't mean to be. I'm, I'm, I'm being critical of the American left as much as I'm being critical of anybody. The point I'm trying to get across here, in, in, in my own way of doing it, I guess, is that I think it's high time for African Americans, highly intelligent, hardworking, down-to-earth people just like everybody else is. It's time for them to look at the facts and say, hey, is the Democratic Party that we've supported for so long, have they really been working in our best interest? Whether the Democrats, the Democrats' tactics towards the African American community have been just misguided policy or if they've been something more nefarious, whichever way it is, the end result has been the same. And it's time for those people in the African American community who are concerned with their own future, concerned with the future of themselves and their families, concerned with the direction of this country. In other words, people who are just like everybody else. It's time for them to look at the bigger picture and say, you know, 
have we really gotten from the Democratic Party what they've promised? By the way I look at it, by the, the numbers I'm seeing, the research I'm seeing, no, they haven't. Now, does that mean that the Democrat, that, that uh, African Americans would have a better home in the conservative movement or in the Republican Party? Some people laugh when you say that, but I think yes, I think they would. I think there's a lot more that most African Americans have in common with the conservative movement than they have in common with the American left. And that's shocking for some of you to hear. You know, when you, when you look at a Democratic Party that divides people into groups and treats them all differently, I don't see why blacks or anybody else should be treated differently. I think they all ought to be treated the same. We all have the same motivations and goals in life, and African Americans are no different. Everybody wants to to provide a good future for their family. Everybody wants to make as much money as they can and live as comfortable of a life as they can. That doesn't matter if you're black or white or whatever. Well, in that respect, the African Americans that want to do that, which is the vast majority, I would expect, they would have a much more, uh, a much more fitting home in the Republican Party and in the, the conservative movement. Likewise, um, one thing that's really not talked about much is that even today in most African American communities, there's a tremendous respect for Christianity, for the church, and that you know people of faith are, are seen as pillars of the community, that they are a significant part of the African American community. That fits right in with the social values of the American right. You know, if you look at a lot of research out there, it'll show you that African Americans are not particularly fond of topics like gay marriage. You know, they're not particularly fond of of you know secularization and, and, and you know things like illegal immigration they're against that there's an awful lot they have in common with us that nobody talks about and I, I don't even like to talk about it as an us versus them thing but darn it that's the that's the that's the political story that's been told so I guess you almost have to look at it that way but you know frankly African Americans I think should be open to looking at the conservative movement looking at what we have to offer. And if you are the type of person, regardless of race, who is concerned with you and your family's well-being in your future, if you are more concerned with your children and their future than you are about the future of some vague group or vague collective, if you're more concerned with what happens within the four walls of your house than you are what happens to some arbitrary group as a whole, then you've got a home in the conservative movement. You've got a home in the Tea Party. You've got a home in the Republican Party. Does that mean the Republican Party is perfect? No. There's all sorts of fights going on within it right now, but generally speaking, I think we're a lot more in tune to what most African Americans and most people of whatever race desire out of their life than what the American left is. So the point of all of this is, as we've heard the phrase before, don't believe the hype. Think this through for yourself. Has the American left delivered on what they promised? And have they been promising the right things? I don't think they have. Now, I'm not going to tell you that the conservative movement is going to, going to do anything particular to help black people. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in giving one group additional help. Or we don't believe in that the government should be used to equalize anything. What we believe in is individualism. We believe that instead of the government stepping in and trying to make decisions for you, we believe the government should be removing obstacles so that you can make your own decisions and succeed or fail as a result, whomever you are. That's what we believe. Food for thought, something to think about, something that's going to piss a lot of people off, I'm sure, but I think it's something that needs to be said, it needs to be looked at, it needs to be talked about. If you have any reaction, let me know. Until next time, this is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.